Well, 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 America, it looks like you can't stop taking away people's freedom of speech. What gives? If I didn't know any better, I'd say you like seeing me dress in revealing patriotic gear to demonstrate my freedom of expression. Look out, South. There's a new American rebellion on the block. New rebellion just dropped. But we aren't here to talk about how I pull this ridiculous getup off. I know. This is, this is for you folks. You are welcome, by the way. No, we're here to talk about censorship. Powerful people and their cronies really love when we the people think that censorship is just the state forcing someone not to express themselves. When the owning class or people acting on their behalf adds to, modifies, or removes information from view, we're supposed to just accept that they can do this because the show, channel, podcast, or platform is their property and they can do whatever they want with it. While this is legally true by the standards of our market capitalist society, who made these standards up? Whoever the answer that question points to, I don't know about you, but I don't like the owning class trying to force me to shut up or wear modest clothing. Ugh. Lucky for you, I am here to put a stop to that. Freedom! 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 Being censored in a country that has stated its utmost value to be free speech is an obvious contradiction. One that begs us to interrogate our socioeconomic system as it concentrates power into the hands of very few. In the last year, we've seen oligarchic power over today's equivalent of the public square congeal to essentially turn off the former president of the United States. We've seen a shadow campaign to silence critics of President Biden, and no, the critics of Biden are not exclusively right-wing. In fact, I would call Biden himself right-wing. We've seen the social media accounts of Palestinians, Iranians, and outwardly socialist parties get removed. And again, We've seen the question arise as to whether or not Fox News should even be allowed to exist. These things probably sound unrelated, but in truth, they're inextricably connected. The situation will always be that those with power have it at your expense. Your speech isn't free. In fact, it's so expensive, you can't afford it. I wanna fly, I wanna drive, I wanna go. What is censorship? The Oxford English Dictionary defines it as the suppression or prohibition of any parts of books, films, news, etc. that are considered obscene, politically unacceptable, or a threat to security. I think most people would agree to that definition, too. Censorship is something we here in America just don't take too kindly to. Just like with taxes, tea, and religion, we've got kind of like a thing about it. The First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America guarantees U.S. citizens and, I quote, the right to say things that threaten the power arrangement in this country. Psych! That's the wrong number! <laughs> now, actually, it says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Doesn't really even address power relations, does it? Just kind of tells you what the state permits, what's allowed, what the class of people with power will not make laws to directly prevent. Free speech is, ironically, a topic that always seems to be about coming up with constraints. What is and isn't free speech? Free speech is anything but absolute. In fact, it only prevents the government from intruding on speech. The First Amendment gives a person no right whatsoever to say whatever they want on a private company's platform. Who has free speech? What's the line? Should the state get involved? If a bear screams fire in a movie theater, does anyone hear it? The answer to every one of these questions lies in an understanding of power. 
except for the bear one, obviously. Let us continue to peruse dictionaries for a working definition of power. Ah, well, it means... A legal or official authority, capacity, or right. They also give an archaic definition of a force of armed men. Hmm. At its most basic, power is relative. For a person, group, or entity to be powerful, it has to have something when another does not. And I don't mean a penis, at least not automatically. It could be a lot of different things. Power is when the person, group, or entity lords that thing over other people. Like, for instance, your landlord lords land over you. Get it? Well, this is coming right out of your security deposit, Ipkiss. This have and have not dynamic is the basis for a conflict in which one side maintains their position over another. For instance, say two people are out while it's pouring down freezing rain. One owns a home and one doesn't even have a place to live, but maybe has $5 in their pocket. Who has the power here? Well, you're in luck, friend, because it only costs five bucks to stay in my house until it stops raining. But don't complain about this arrangement or criticize my house or my decor or I will call the police a force of armed men and I will make you leave. According to the First Amendment, this isn't censorship. Yet, as a viewer, you're probably looking at me and thinking, eh. So why do people think it's only censorship if it's directly by the state? Or, for that matter, that it's only censorship if it's by law? Like, what's the deal with that? And do people really not notice that the whole Congress shall establish no law thing gives a ton of wiggle room? Well, on YouTube, it would probably have been going too far if I myself had done the wiggling. Like, recording artists that aren't critical of capital on a major record label, fine, though. Instead, did you know I can kick myself in the nuts? That shit's funny, all right? And establishment types seem to think that it's like some kind of own. Like, like I said, I just think it's funny, though. Who cares? What I'm kicking isn't the source of my power, at least automatically so. Uh, in fact, I don't really have any power. And that's precisely why I'll kick myself in the nuts at the end of this video, if you stick around. Click like, subscribe, enable all notifications, and become a patron at patreon.com. Anyways, I believe that part of the reason people think it's only censorship if the state does it is that we're not really supposed to understand exactly what the state is. Fortunately, everyone can learn and develop. According to Frederick Engels, the state is the admission that society has split into classes with conflicting economic interests, which would otherwise consume themselves and society in fruitless struggle. Therefore, it becomes necessary to have a power seemingly standing above society that would alleviate the conflict and keep it within the bounds of order. This power is the state. The materialist conception of the state is that of an apparatus that arises to maintain society despite contradictions between classes. To do this, it must preserve and enforce those contradictions, which requires power, specifically forces of armed men. Hmm. But also through associated systems like prisons and other institutions of coercion. Particularly when talking about what people are and aren't allowed to say and do, it's important to emphasize that the order which arises in the form of a state is oppression and not some form of reconciliation or fostering of friendly relations. According to V.I. Lenin, the state is an organ of class rule, an organ for the oppression of one class by another. It is the creation of order which legalizes and perpetuates this oppression by moderating the conflict between classes. In the opinion of liberal politicians, however, order means the reconciliation of classes and not the oppression of one class by another, ultimately depriving the oppressed classes of definite means and methods of struggle to overthrow the oppressors. And people think states gave Lenin a chub. Summing up, a state is an instrument for the exploitation of the oppressed class and maintains a society divided into antagonistic classes by deliberately keeping everyday people from taking power. A state is not an instrument to compromise between the needs and wants of opposing classes. 
The most important divide to grasp here is the private ownership of capital, the haves and the have-nots. Now, we're not talking about your toothbrush or your PS4. We're talking about capital. Loosely put, capital can be money, resources, or assets, but most specifically in capitalism, hard capital is the means to produce commodities. If you own the means to produce something for exchange at a mass level, like a factory and the machinery in it, or a technology and or social platform, congrats, you're owning class. Whereas if you sell your labor to this class of people for a wage or have the potential to, you're working, you're working class. It's that's way less cool. Owners have power and everyone else doesn't. Owners make the choices as to what happens in the world and everyone else doesn't. Owners live in luxury and everyone else doesn't. Oppressor, oppressed, contradictions, antagonisms. There are gradients like professional slash managerial workers or even the petite bourgeoisie, but for the most part, people's interests are pretty easy to suss out. Small business owners might ideologically agree with large capitalists, and they might not. Who knows? They aren't all one thing. But a small business owner's actual material interests are much more similar to a worker's than they are to Jeff Bezos, who owns the largest retailer, delivery service, and a slew of other things. I mean, he owns Washington, D.C.'s biggest newspaper. A worker might think of their small business owning boss as a jerk on a power trip, and that boss may very well be just that. But the small business owner is impotent and doesn't rule society. Jeff Bezos does. Also, I'd argue that these gradients are not particularly important to the vast majority of people. Like, you don't overhear people at the supermarket talk about the petty bourgeoisie a whole lot. And if you do, why do you shop for groceries at a podcast? This conceptualization of class in mind, I want to bring up the adage, freedom of the press is limited to those who own one. This phrase is attributed to a number of different people. A reporter named H.L. Mencken said it in the 1940s. Another reporter named A.J. Liebling said it in the 1960s. And I am sure that there's others. Liebling contextualized it as criticism of newspaper monopolies as privately owned public utilities exempt from regulation, which he believed violated freedom of the press. He also asserted that the freedom of speech of any individual journalist was determined solely by whoever published them. You know how I mentioned Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post? Well, the Washington Post's narrative is considered credible nationally, right? Also, it's a business. It has to, in at least some way, serve the interests of its owner, Jeff Bezos, his business partners, remember he owns Amazon and works with a near endless number of people, and ultimately the class of people running things, even if just because their interests are fundamentally similar to Bezos and his direct partners. And if it didn't, the for-profit Washington Post wouldn't exist. When other journalists contradict a credible narrative, whether what they're saying is true or not, they're either ignored or become a target for a subordinate narrative intended to discredit dissenters. You know, because they're contradicting all those interests I just mentioned. Now, obviously, newspapers are far from the only source of information as to what's going on in the world we have in 2021, but this dynamic applies everywhere. You do the labor of constructing your personal reality from parts presented to you by various representatives of capital holders, ultimately reflective of their own interests. And if you want to raise an objection, well, you can go onto a platform like Twitter, which is also owned by someone who gets to dictate all the rules and what is tolerable and then decide what gets enforced when and for whom, there you can fight with other people who want to present themselves as credible by the standards of the interests I previously stated in the public sphere. Influencers are presenting themselves as credible either for a job or for attention. I'm obviously doing it for the latter. And the ones that aren't actively presenting at least a critique of ideology are ultimately fighting in the interest of the ruling orders. In the final analysis, they're adhering to the ruling orders' credible narratives. Sure, you can say whatever you want, but your speech isn't equal to a representative or aspirant representative of capital, and not even those people make the decision if they get to speak. Capital does. Who puts them on MSNBC and Fox News anyways? the people who own and run MSNBC and Fox News. 
Who verifies accounts on Twitter? Well, Twitter does. So it has to serve the interests of those companies, companies that work with them, companies like them, and the system in general. And if they didn't, these four private companies would not exist. I don't know about you, but I don't know any communists with like 5.5 million just lying around if I had time at the Super Bowl to advocate for a stateless, classless society or hell, even the 150,000 necessary to run a full page black and white ad in the New York Times. Even if they did, the owners of those mediums and their representatives could just deny the ads or they could run the ad, but also run as many articles or whatever other content they want about how the ad was stupid ultimately reinforcing the credible narrative through the power they have over what you see. Even if you do have the money, you don't own the medium. And that is what class actually is. When you're in your home, you can't be censored. Everywhere else, um, it could happen. It could be the more traditional method of deleting things people have said, the incredibly obvious but still pretty effective method of banning or removing people, or the more insidious and clever method of contextualizing and selectively boosting and de-emphasizing information while curating in-group and out-group dynamics to police narrative on behalf of capital and the capitalist state. The owning class just does whatever the hell they want, and the state exists to ensure that they can do it. I don't care whether the US government censors you or Jack from Twitter does it. Ultimately, it's the same power exerting itself. The oppressing class forcing its will on the oppressed class. A class of doms, a class of subs, and an apparatus to stop the subs from collectively switching. If we see free speech through this lens, the First Amendment is kind of a we hear you, we see you, we're listening to you type statement, somewhere between deflection and lip service. If the capitalist state exists to maintain the class contradictions of owning and not owning, and it does, then those who own are absolutely capable of censorship via state power, because it's the same power. But there's even more to consider. With both state and capital, the power to enforce a rule is the same power to choose not to. On January 6th, 2021, several right-wing nonprofit political orgs called things like Women for America First, Stop the Steal, and TrumpIsSexy.org bust thousands of working-class people to the nation's capital for a rally. Yeah, that last one, TrumpIsSexy.org, uh, that one was fake, but the rest were real. They were joined by some petty bourgeoisie who had flown in on chartered flights they took selfies on, but like I said earlier, no one actually cares about that term. There were also a number of right-wing influencers motivated purely by attention economy market dynamics to, I don't know, do it for the gram, I guess. Hello, U.S. Senate, yes, we have a fraudulent election. I would like to report. Yeah, we need to get our boy Donald J. Trump into office. Yeah, yeah, can we do that real quick? Oh, yeah? Oh, thank you. The organizations had riled these people up, seeding and popularizing narratives about a stolen election. So about that steal these people wanted to stop, it wasn't so much a steal, but more like a well-funded cabal of powerful people ranging across industries and ideologies working together behind the scenes to influence perceptions, change rules and laws, steer media coverage, and control the flow of information. No, I I'm not joking either. I'm, uh, I'm directly quoting Time magazine. It sounds like a paranoid fever dream. A well-funded cabal of powerful people ranging across industries and ideologies, working together behind the scenes to influence perceptions, change rules and laws, steer media coverage, and control the flow of information. Time magazine, founded in 1923, has a highly factual MBFC rating due to proper sourcing and a clean fact check record. Infowars, it is not. And yet, there was a conspiracy unfolding behind the scenes, an informal alliance between left-wing activists and business titans. The handshake between businesses and labor was just one component of a vast, cross-partisan campaign to protect the election, an extraordinary shadow effort dedicated to not winning the vote, but ensuring it would be free, fair, credible, and uncorrupted. I don't know about you, but 
I don't associate the words free, fair, credible, and uncorrupted with a well-funded cabal of powerful people ranging across industries and ideologies, working together behind the scenes to influence perceptions, change rules and laws, steer media coverage, and control the flow of information. Have I said that 100% completely real, actual goddamn quote from Time Magazine enough times yet? A properly functioning democracy depends on an informed electorate is an adage Thomas Jefferson, one of the writers of this shit, is often given credit for. He was regarded as a big time democracy guy, although the actual quote was way less badass sounding. In a letter Jefferson wrote to Richard Price in January of 1789, he said, wherever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. Way less catchy, but it's not really like he was designing a t-shirt or something, so who cares? Basically, to protect democracy. This Protect the Results coalition of business leaders, labor leaders, and more than 150 liberal groups from the Women's March to the Sierra Club to Color of Change, from Democrats.com to the Democratic Socialists of America, in order for them to protect democracy, they had to do what Thomas Jefferson might call a not-democracy. Look, his actual quote was kind of lame. Uh, not democracy sounds exactly like the kind of dud I think Thomas Jefferson might fart out. Also, I'm just saying that by the standards of a revered figure, this is fucked up. To be clear, Thomas owned over 600 slaves. Jefferson is definitely not the arbiter of what is fair and equitable. Still, the Protect the Results Coalition's actions were completely antithetical to democracy in that they intentionally prevented the public from being informed and instead ran a blatantly ideological information campaign. They had to work behind the scenes to influence perceptions, change rules and laws, steer media coverage, and control the flow of information, remember? I keep saying that because it's absolutely insane that a credible mainstream publication would just openly say a thing which undermines the credibility of, well, the entire mainstream media and America's institutions by claiming that for more than a year, a loosely organized coalition of operatives scrambled to shore up America's institutions. That's the shit they've called conspiracy theories for as long as I can remember. But they're happy to say it. The participants want the secret history of the 2020 election told. They want us to know they have that power. They're pissing in our open mouths. For months, Donald Trump had been tweeting that the election was rigged. It was all very, very strange, Trump said on December 2nd. Within days after the election, we witnessed an orchestrated effort to anoint a winner, even while many key states were still being counted. In a way, Trump was right, which is going to make you think I'm a conspiracy nut. Except. Again, I am just quoting this article verbatim. This is the kind of shit this man was tweeting. And they're like, in a way, Trump was right. That kind of insanity is really profitable, too. To demonstrate this, let's go back to 2009 when Trump joined Twitter. Also, as a quick warning before we proceed, these tweets are all fucking incredible. I'm not going to make some kind of case to you that Donald Trump is a good person. He is not, but he was the king of posters. Rest in power. Donald Trump built mass popularity over the following decade, blatantly lying about a large number of things. If misinformation was and or is a problem, the Obama birther controversy, deceptive vaccine oriented sentiment and harassment of various opponents should have been enough to dump him back then. But they didn't do it. One in every eight Trump tweets was a personal insult of some kind, many based entirely on lies, all completely hilarious, let's be real. Just from the beginning of his term as president until May 2019, Trump had insulted 598 people, including many private citizens. And again, remember his insults are generally assertions of supposed facts like bad ratings or failing businesses or doesn't live there. In 2017, analysts estimated Donald Trump was worth about $2 billion to Twitter. 
At the time, that was about one-fifth of Twitter's full value. This was stated to be because Trump was a reliable source of engagement and drove engagement-oriented behaviors in many different types of people. These people wouldn't necessarily leave the service without Trump there, but were extremely active due to his presence. Hi, I'm John. And I'm his roommate, Ron. Together, we are defined, defined by, by Trump. Trump. I realized early on that instead of taking the time to formulate opinions and a perspective, it was much easier to find out what Donald Trump says and angrily disagree. Or in my case, enthusiastically agree. And to Twitter, their advocacy for or against Trump was ultimately simply just activity in an algorithm. And that activity, to be clear, is the product they're selling to advertisers. And every single time Twitter decided not to enforce their terms of service on Donald Trump because he was worth so much to them, from 2009 to the present, but especially after he became president, they exercised the exact same power that they used when they eventually banned him. They put forward a set of rules, but since they own the means, they have the power to choose whether or not to enforce them. And they didn't enforce them until 2021. So what changed? Many believe the platforms did this because the public demanded it, but that wasn't new. The same cross-section of the public had demanded it literally the entire time he's been on Twitter, and by this point in the video, it should be obvious that capital is totally unaccountable to the public. The decision to ban Donald Trump was explicitly one made by the ruling class of capitalists. To put it simply, Donald Trump just outlived his usefulness to them. He got a couple of hardline pro-business guys onto the Supreme Court, repeatedly cut taxes for the rich, and managed to divert all the liberals' hatred from the entire GOP onto himself. If he disappeared, what would they even have to hate anymore? I mean, now in 2021, the Democrats are just basically continuing all the same damn policies anyways. Nothing has fundamentally changed, you see. What did change was the media's narrative, specifically that the NGO-enabled spectacle on January 6th was, in fact, a fascist coup and one inspired entirely by Donald Trump, rather than the right-wing version of the kind of apparatus described in that mind-melting Time article. From January 6th to January 8th, every pundit, politician, organ network who had been critical of Trump was out in force. Media narratives about Twitter ranged from critical but pleading to angry and demanding. Fox News recognized the opportunity to shift blame for their own Time Magazine article-like shenanigans. An attempted coup, a coup d'etat, a soft coup, for lack of a better word, coup. This is a low-energy coup, it's a coup attempt. Which was an opportunity for OAN to soak up the Trump fans and give them a place to feel special. And old Trump was banned from all social media that mattered. Twitter, Facebook, and of course, Pinterest, who definitely didn't ban him explicitly to be included on lists of platforms that banned him. Oh yeah, Donald Trump is well known for his crazy pins. When Trump was banned, the analysts were proven right. Their estimate bore out that he was worth about one-fifth of Twitter's value, and their stock dropped about 17% over the following several days. Twitter did immediately take a hit, but the media narrative quickly reversed course, praising and promoting their stunning bravery, and their stock recovered to record highs, keeping in mind that the majority of stock activity is from the same people that the media ultimately works in the interest of. They jettisoned their most valuable asset, but the market really is just a means for capital holders to plan the economy. While it can be volatile from sudden change, the will of capital holders is eventually seen via its mechanics. Our prefer free promotional method. And their will was dumping Trump. And then they pumped Twitter stock. It was a dump and pump. People doubled their money buying on the dip. Hold the line! Get it? Because it's bad when retail investors do it, but nobody says anything when the capitalists do? Anyways, again, freedom of the press is limited to those who own one. While Twitter didn't have to cave into public pressure, it did have to cave into the pressure of other media, meaning other capital, which had coalesced around a specific demand. As big as Twitter is, a mass of capital acting in unison for a specific purpose is clearly not something Twitter is interested in fighting for too long, and ultimately they know they should just go along with such a coalition anyways. Donald Trump and his supporters who had shown up to stop the steal. All ideologically pro-capitalist folks, by the way, understood something liberals seem unwilling to admit, that power in this country was coming down on them. They were being shut off. 
Their opinion was deemed deplorable by the structures of power in this country and ceased to be allowed. Outlets, orgs, shitty live TV comedy shows, and any other visible institutional power was working to undermine what these folks wanted to say about the world. And right now, we're talking about garbage conservative capitalists and their supporters. Not exactly a good place to look for solutions, but conservatism obviously has power. It's just not the dominant hegemonic ideology. When you think of the conservatives who hold the most power in this country, it's rich old turds that no one likes. Even if you disagree with these con men, their companies, and their orcs, and I hope you do, I want to impart on you that they can still be shut off by people with more power than them. This in mind, imagine what can be done to you, someone without that kind of money and power, on social media, in the traditional media, and anywhere that doesn't require the state's direct involvement. That isn't freedom of speech. But you knew that already. It doesn't matter how wrong any of these people are about anything. It's not free speech. And again, it is Twitter or MSNBC's property, and they really can do what they want with it. And that means we don't have free speech. This conspiracy time details was explicitly legal. In fact, they actually changed some laws themselves. Imagine the kind of power necessary to do that. If capital, the owning class, the bourgeoisie, whatever, if they want an outcome, they have the power and authority to rearrange everything. They can demonize dissent like genuine criticism of Joe Biden. They can deprioritize controversies like Hunter Biden's laptop. And the state apparatus exists to maintain the class antagonism that allows them to do that. The libs can do it to the conservatives and both can do it to you. And if someone has power because they're in the owning class or acting on their behalf, it is state power. A capitalist state exists purely to maintain capitalist class antagonisms. This applies universally. Even if a representative of the capitalist state, maybe the most powerful individual person in the world, gets in the way, even just ideologically, even if they don't actually materially change anything, they can shut that person off. The January 8th banning of Donald Trump was a vulgar display of power. The power to shut off the President of the United States' ability to speak to his constituency is massive and it is censorship. In a capitalist state, the distinction between state or private censorship should not be a defining factor. The class antagonisms required for something like Twitter Incorporated to even exist are the state's responsibility to maintain, and the fact capital can censor the head of state should tell you where the power in a capitalist state is actually derived from. It was also a vulgar display of power every time Trump broke their rules and they didn't enforce them though still taking the time to enforce them on dissidents and critics. The capitalist state apparatus, which exists purely to maintain the class antagonisms of a capitalist society, doesn't have to have a direct role. As a state actor, Trump didn't have any real power in this. Also, as a capitalist, he kind of sucks. He could screw you or me over pretty bad, but clearly Twitter had a way of dealing with the losses associated with no longer having him on the platform. The author of The Art of the Deal no longer had leverage, and we no longer hear from him. On January 2nd, 2021, author, former Time Magazine editor-at-large, former New York Times columnist, and current MSNBC and vice commentator Anand Giridharadis, posed the following question. It's time for this question to be front and center. Should Fox News be allowed to exist? Brain mashing as a business model shouldn't be legal. Garrett Artis is hardly unique in saying something like this. Fox News is viewed by many as a unique threat, a destructive force that misrepresents or outwardly omits facts in service of a narrative. In 2015, a filmmaker by the name of Jen Sanko created a documentary about her World War II vet father who changed from a lifelong non-political Democrat to an angry right-wing fanatic after his discovery of talk radio on a lengthened commute to work. The film follows her journey from not knowing anything at all to knowing literally everything. Senko finds this to be a widespread phenomenon and seemingly uncovers some of the forces behind it. 
Her focus is on the alternative conservative-centric media that has sprung up over several decades as a reaction to the 1960s, as well as the dismantling of the Fairness Doctrine, which we'll get into in a minute. Ultimately, she posits that conservative talk radio and Fox News changed the country's direction and culture, misinformed millions, divided families, and even the country itself. And in truth, we definitely do see plenty of folks like Papa Senko out there all brainwashed and whatnot, right? <laughs> Those big dummies falling for conservative propaganda, morons, deplorables, right? <laughs> Thankfully, the totally non-ideological Jen Sanko, an individual of true purity and incision, was able to raise enough money on Kickstarter to document the bad people that we need to get rid of in order for the world to become good again. Whether Sanko knows it or not, she's engaged in the same sleight of hand the mainstream media has always engaged in. Liberal media does a lot of work to seem like it's the avenue by which real news and facts are delivered while it's the right that's the propaganda machine. Note how liberal media, even when literally telling us it has been engaging in conspiracy, is depicted as factual or not liberal and even non-ideological. Time literally pissed a liberal conspiracy into our open mouths, remember? But it's also somehow a conspiracy theory that there even is a liberal media at all. Meanwhile, conservative media is depicted as the alternative. Alternative media, alternative facts, alternative reality. However, before the alternative media, Jen Senko and her cavalcade of totally non-ideological truth-tellers like David Brock, who's definitely not a slimeball Democratic operative who came up with a loophole that allows super PACs to openly collaborate with candidates, having been previously barred by law from doing so and shows up repeatedly in this film, described for us a rose, what did we have? A lot of people would tell you that the news was actually fair and balanced before cable news networks like Fox happened. In the previous era, we had the Fairness Doctrine, which required broadcasters to devote time to controversial public concerns and to air contrasting views regarding those matters. And the Fairness Doctrine actually said that you have to program in the public interest. And so as a result of that, uh, radio and television stations had real news. It operated for 50 years. In 1949, it was actually voted in as law by the U.S. Congress. It said if you are watching or listening to your local television or radio station and there are points of view that are not being included in the discussion and you wish for them to be in there, go complain to your station. If they don't give you satisfaction, then send a complaint to the FCC. It didn't guarantee equal time. It reminded broadcasters that they had a public trust, that they should include some views that might go against their own or that might not be popular or favorable to them. It was dropped in the 80s by the Reagan administration. The repeal of the Fairness Doctrine ended up resulting in an explosion of talk radio. While this might sound fair, we also have to recognize that when a news source large enough to be considered one of the main ones says, this is the left view and this is the right, whether intentionally or not, that sets the confines of public debate. All of this has nothing to do with liberal or conservative bias. According to the propaganda model, both liberal and conservative wings of the media, whatever those terms are supposed to mean, fall within the same framework of assumptions. Uh, in fact, if the system functions well, it ought to have a liberal bias, or at least appear to, because if it appears to have a liberal bias, that will serve to balance thought even more effectively. In other words, if the press is indeed adversarial and liberal and all these bad things, then how can I go beyond it? They're already so extreme in their opposition to power that to go beyond it would be to take off from the planet. So therefore, it must be that the presuppositions that are accepted in the liberal media are sacrosanct, can't go beyond them. Uh, and a well-functioning system would in fact have a bias of that kind. The media would then serve to say, in effect, thus far and no further. To present something outside of our very limited idea of a political spectrum comes off as unrealistic, fantastical, or dangerous. It's through this dynamic that we can see that what state and capital authorities deemed fair didn't force network news to give meaningful, unbiased attention to, say, communists. In fact, the Fairness Doctrine became law at the height of the Red Scare in 1949. 
Is it not a controversial matter of public interest that workers are being exploited by an elite class of owners and rulers? Could we abolish class? Well, I can't tell you for sure because it hasn't happened, but it certainly wasn't discussed in even the most supposedly fair of times. There's entire books of historical recounting of case after case of anti-communist bias in even the most liberal of media sources. What we get instead is redirection into solutions like voting for Trump or voting for Biden. And it's under the pretense that that's just how things are. Depicting or describing reality requires editorial choices. The world is massive, and the number of events which occur is impossible to cover in totality. So deciding what is and isn't newsworthy is, by necessity, a censorious undertaking. Whether or not someone wants to enact an agenda, their ideology will guide the choices they make. And the ideology of neoliberalism and deference to capital is the ideology people are generally operating on. A completely innocent, well-meaning editor can and will make choices that ultimately support society's elites. These choices can also be influenced by many factors, like their own personal investment portfolio, their health, their relatives, their exposure to life outside a big city, lack of experience with poverty, racial myths, a crippling obsession with large breasts. This is my story. And we, the consumers, have been directed to be suspicious of each other rather than air our grievance about the owning and ruling class and the ideologies which maintain their interests. That's conspiracy bullshit, man. Don't say it. If an anti-war activist saw that Joe Biden had bombed Syria, it might be tempting for them to look around at other people and say, Ugh. Look how obsessed they are with frivolous crap. The U.S. bombing the Middle East is really important. Why don't people pay attention to that? But here's the thing. If most people don't see it or hear it, how are they going to integrate it into their opinion? The way the media covers an issue is the default framework people will work off of. That's how most people will have seen it. If the media repeatedly covers it or some aspect of it, that is going to be something people know more about. And if you deviate from that manner of addressing the issue, you won't be platformed. Or you will be, but will be contextualized as stupid or evil. If I write, fuck the poor is on an orange, I intend to serve my beautiful partner here, but throw out the peel with the message on it before I serve it to them, that message is not going to figure into their opinion. Unless they start digging through the trash. If they find the orange peel, they might be mad at me. But, I mean, I would kind of also know they just dug through my trash. And that's weird. So, anyways, assuming they aren't Gollum digging through my trash looking for their precious, they're never going to receive my now censored message, fuck the pores. It's never going to be a conversation. I effectively removed that sentiment because between social norms, my ownership of the trash can and my access to it in the confines of social acceptability, I have the power here. Now, let's say some random in a green bodysuit started digging through my trash and found the peel. Not only could you use effects in post to put something else where they are, but they could show my partner. That is, unless I called a special body of armed men and get that bitch out of my house before they can do it. Metaphorically, the green bodysuit bitch is an investigative journalist. I'm capital here, and the special bodies of armed men I'm calling for the assistance of are the state. They're maintaining class relations here. Now let's say I decided the green bodysuit bitch needs to be taken out of the equation altogether. Let's say I wrote that shit on the orange peel, then told my partner myself. I could come up with any number of stories for how someone else wrote that on the orange peel. All of them would be plausible. Here, I am capital and I own the media. I created a spectacle out of it that people buy into and accept is real, and the information is contextualized however I want. When someone is asking should Fox News be allowed to exist, they're generally not addressing this dynamic. What they're usually asking is, should the bad people be allowed to do news? But until we're framing this through the lens of actual class relations, who owns, who has power, and what do they do with it, we're not asking real questions about speech and freedom. 
The question shouldn't be, is Peter saying a good thing or a bad thing here? Or is Peter on my team or in the basket of deplorables? Instead, the question should be, should Peter get to bypass the green bodysuit bitch and make up whatever the hell they want to tell their partner? If that's the question we're asking, then no, I don't think Fox News should be allowed to exist. Or MSNBC or CNN or the BBC in the UK, or RT in Russia. The state and the media that uphold its justifying ideology exist to maintain class antagonisms, and ultimately the antagonism here is people who own get to dictate reality to the people who don't. Obviously, there is a lot more to it. I wrote a book called Custom Reality and You about how the situation is ultimately that. Although it feels like self-direction, we do the alienated labor of reality production under the direction of capital. But if we're purely talking about free speech, you've watched a situation where the green bodysuit bitch, the critical voice seeking truth, is marginalized and capital or the state are allowed to dictate what is real. That's what all network news is, that's what all cable news is, and that's what all state news is. If they're following a program which benefits and or preserves the currently existing class antagonisms, the rules they set for themselves are arbitrary. If it benefits the owning and ruling class and no green bodysuit bitches are able to make a fuss, these powerful entities are the ones with true freedom of speech. Just like you can choose to go over your calories for the day and no one's going to do shit, these guys are accountable to no one, except you are going to regret going over your calories, I promise. And that's going to make you think of your calories for the day, and you're going to go, ah, oh, shit, Peter was right about the calories. Also everything. The only real difference is that when you go over your calories, it doesn't have a meaningful effect on the outside world. These guys curate the official reality. If you going over your calories affected their power, their hegemonic ideology, or their status as the ruling class in some way, they would stop you. And if you said something inconvenient for them, they could just remove you or contextualize you. They could create a narrative about you that nullifies the value of your words. They could smear you and make people think that you're stupid or evil. The media, the capitalists, the owning class, whatever, they have the power to do any of this. They just have to want to. You can't. You are not free to do that. It is not free to do that. So what is censorship? The suppression or prohibition of any parts of books, films, news, etc. that are considered obscene, politically unacceptable, or a threat to security? Yeah? Note that definition doesn't contain any references to the state, nor does it limit the act of censorship to outright prohibition. Just like examining the First Amendment's language reveals a sometimes overlooked flexibility, we find that suppression is a pretty broad term, meaning one, to put down by authority or force, two, to keep from public knowledge, or three, to exclude from consciousness. Clearly, a big company can just ban the most powerful individual state actor or keep a malicious but popular user that benefits them around for as long as they want by selectively enforcing their own rules. But could a person, organization, or other entity keep something from public knowledge without outright prohibiting it? Well, yes, of course they could. They do it all day, every day. Remember when we were talking about how people can't seem to focus on Biden bombing Syria? That's it, right there. Look at that, that's the thing. What part of a well-funded cabal of powerful people ranging across industries and ideologies working together behind the scenes to influence perceptions, change rules and laws, steer media coverage and control the flow of information? Don't you understand, people? There are a ton of ways to do it too. Let's say some green bodysuit bitch is out there criticizing marketing, demystifying how manipulative brands and companies are to everyday people. The first step they do is to categorize the opponent negatively, call them grifters, clout chasers, class reductionists, even fascists, red-brown strasserites, or what the fuck ever. Putting an opponent into one of these categories has a pretty good chance of suppressing whatever they're saying from public knowledge. If that doesn't work, start characterizing the person individually, like try to discredit them because one time they were on a national TV show hosted by Steve Harvey and they kicked themselves in the nuts. Please welcome the groin kicker himself, Peter Coffin. 
Come on, Peter, let me see. All right, here we go. I can still do it, too. See? Oof. Oh, that still sucks. Uh, you're laughing at my pain while being surprised at my flexibility, but it also doesn't make anything that I say less true. Also, yes, Steve Harvey was actually pretty cool. Reunion episode when, Steve? Beyond all that, the information climate we live in is beyond overwhelming nowadays. Forget the fairness doctrine. It's not even possible to know everything that's going on. And even if every... Oh, shit. Oh, that, that actually fucking sucks. Forget the fairness doctrine. It's not even possible to know everything that's going on at any given time. And if everyone just gets flooded with information at all times, especially validating, satisfying information that tells you all the juicy shit about your favorite celebs, influencers, or the shitty guy down the hall or whatever, that is easier to pay attention to than an article mapping out the corruption or about Biden bombing Syria. Oh, why can't we pay attention to that? Oh. I could stay here all day and describe various ways to discredit true narratives while transmuting false narratives into mainstream, credible ones. In some ways, it sounds like alchemy, but it's really just America. So who can actually accomplish that? Those who own and the state that exists to preserve their ownership. Yes, there are warring factions in the ruling class with different ideas about what culture should be like. The royals openly disdain everyone below them while their offspring want to be influencers because they think it's effective to pretend to be of the people. The Republicans fetishize religion and tradition while the Democrats fetishize science and progression. Neither genuinely does any of that, though. Amazon wants to take over everywhere you shop while Shipt wants to do your shopping for you. But what every single one of these entities completely agrees on is that they should have power over you. So much so that they work tirelessly to preserve that mode of operation. As such, we don't really have free speech. The amendment in our constitution that supposedly guarantees the right is really the government saying, mm, sorry, not my department. Our speech is subject to power dynamics as much as anything else, and in the US, power is applied through mechanisms and dynamics that ultimately act like markets, even if purely because of ideology. We have access to speech in the same way we have access to healthcare. It's a right, and everyone is going to tell you that it's your right, but private industry ultimately makes the decisions, and we pay for it. Our credibility, our ability to make a living, etc. Question power, and power cuts us off. Censorship is, again, the suppression or prohibition of stuff that's considered obscene, politically unacceptable, or a threat to security. Well, it's obscene to criticize what's politically acceptable, and if people take it to heart, yes, it's eventually going to be a threat to security. The ruling class's security, specifically. Our speech isn't free, but while the cost is high to question the powerful, it's ultimately because they can't afford what we have to say. Fuck you, Debbie! Now this looks like a job for me, so everybody, just follow me, cause we need a little controversy, cause it feels so empty without me. Now this looks like a job for me, so everybody, just follow me, cause we need a little controversy, cause it feels so empty without me. Now, now, now.